Welcome to the Invader Historical Foundation YouTube channel. I'm Jonathan Claiborne. This video is going to kick off an in-depth look into the Douglas Counter-Invader. This first episode, we're going to cover the events leading up to the development of the Counter-Invader and the Counter-Invader prototype. Before we get into the details, I want to provide some clarifications that will be applicable to all of the videos in this series. All 40 of the B-26Ks begin with the U.S. Air Force serial number 64-17. For the sake of conversation, I will refer to these planes by their three-digit suffix. So if I say 642, what I mean is U.S. Air Force serial number 64-17642, and 669 is Air Force serial number 64-17669. With that out of the way, let's begin. The Counter Invader story begins in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Arriving too late to really showcase their capabilities to the fullest during World War II, the invaders had proven their worth in Korea. But by the end of the 1950s, they were being outpaced and replaced by newer, modern aircraft in increasing numbers. They were being relegated for use as utility planes, target tugs, drone controllers, and training planes. They were being pushed out of the Air Force inventory, shipped to Air National Guard squadrons, sold off to foreign militaries, and lent to France. Many were stripped down and sold on the civilian market where they found second life as executive transports, survey planes, test platforms, smuggling planes, law enforcement planes, and fire bombers. However, the invaders still had teeth and were more than capable of bringing an impressive array of firepower onto targets that needed to be eliminated. And this fact was something that the CIA was acutely aware of. The CIA continued to use the invaders for off the books missions beginning in the mid 1950s all over Southeast Asia. The CIA used them in Operation Mill Pond, Project Farmgate, Project Black Watch, and Project Sweet Sue, to name a few. To their credit, the CIA operations with A-26s were very successful and prompted the CIA to have two special purpose planes built for their use. Seeing the success of the CIA operations, the US Air Force assisted in these efforts at clandestine warfare by creating the 4400th Combat Crew Training Squadron in April 1961. The squadron was codenamed Jungle Jim. They originally spent time training at Eglin Field in Florida, where they were sent overseas to Ben Hoa, Vietnam for live fire training exercises that just happened to involve destroying enemy vehicles and supply convoys. The official cover story told by the government was that this unit was sent to train the South Vietnamese Air Force pilots on how to fly strike missions and that the US crew would not actively be participating in combat. In practice, the US crews of pilot and navigator flew the operations and took along a South Vietnamese Air Force observer in the gunner's compartment to keep up the pretenses. Eventually, they stopped bringing the South Vietnamese crew member altogether, and these pilots and crew of the 4400th Combat Crew Training Squadron were the first Invader Air Commandos, elite combat pilots. They will get a video all to themselves later on. In 1963, things came to a head for the aging invader. The invader airframes, now referred to as the B-26 invader, were almost 20 years old and put on a lot of hours and stress over the years. In August of 1963, a 4400th Combat Crew Training Squadron plane initiated a diving attack against a ground target, and then, during the climb out, a wing sheared off of the plane causing it to crash and the crew to perish. Six months later, in February 1964, during a demonstration of a strafing attack against a ground target at Eglinfield, Florida, another invader lost a wing, resulting in the death of both crew. This accident happened to be witnessed firsthand by Air Force Brass, and as a result of the second fatal accident, the Air Force grounded all B-26 invaders and pulled them from service. 
Inspections of the remaining airframes following the accidents revealed that many of them had bad signs of stress fractures along the wing spars, and almost all of them were in serious need of overhaul. The Air Force decided to formally drop the Douglas Invader from their inventory in 1964 and made the decision that none of the airframes would be repaired or put back into service. They deemed the operation too costly to make the plane safe when they compared the cost of newer, faster planes. That would have been the end of the Invader's story, but for a single cog that was already turning. In 1962, Air Force analysts noted the great success of the Jungle Jump Squadron was having in Southeast Asia. They determined that the aging A-26 airframes needed to be upgraded and modernized to continue to be effective, and the analysts drew up plans and recommendations to do exactly that. From this analysis and recommendation, the B-26K counter invaders were born. In 1962, the U.S. Air Force contracted Onmark Engineering Company of Van Nuys, California to take a single existing Invader airframe and alter it to the analyst specifications. Onmark had already made a name for themselves by altering many civilian Invaders that were being used as executive transports. Despite their extensive knowledge, the Air Force wanted a working prototype for evaluation purposes. In October 1962, they delivered a recon version of the Invader, an RB-26C, serial number 4435634, to Onmark for the modifications. Onmark accepted the contract and produced the YB-26K Counter Invader prototype. This plane had a slew of upgrades that differentiated it from standard B-26 Invaders, including completely replacing the standard wing sparse with bigger, beefier versions rebuilding the empennage to include a larger rudder to increase turning performance, converting the gunner's compartment into an observation room, installing permanent 165-gallon wingtip tanks, replacing the old R2879 2100 horsepower engines with new R2800 103W 2500 horsepower water-cooled engines, adding new Hamilton standard propellers and automatic feathering reverse thrust capability, remanufacturing the fuselages as needed, upgrading the landing gears to make them more durable, less prone to collapse, including adding nose wheel steering, replacing the existing tires and brakes with KC-135 wheel assemblies, installing engine fire extinguisher systems, installing anti-ice systems in the wings, adding higher capacity electrical systems. Fuel capacity was increased from 925 U.S. gallons to 1,230 U.S. gallons. Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JATO, was used to improve short field operations. Cockpit air conditioning was installed. The avionics were completely upgraded, including new UHF, VHF, and HF radios for navigation and communications, as well as a revised instrument panel. The controls were upgraded, including making the plane a dual control cockpit. They also modified the armament of the Invader. They removed the upper and lower turrets completely. They put an eight gun nose on the plane, intending for this to be the standard. They added eight underwing reinforced hardpoints made by Baldwin Locomotive. While the internal Bombay retained the original 4,000 pound load, the reinforced wing mounts coupled with the beefier wing spars increased the maximum underwing load to 8,000 pounds, allowing for a maximum operational payload of 8,000 pounds of ordnance in any configuration spread between the underwing and the bomb bay. The prototype YB-26K was completed on 28 January 1963 and began test flights at Edwards Air Force Base, California. The prototype was tested rigorously by both the U.S. Air Force and the FAA for several months at Edwards. On the 1st of June 1963, the YB-26K prototype was assigned to the 1st Air Commando Wing at Herbert Field, Florida for further evaluation. The 1st Air Commando Wing tested the prototype's weapons capabilities as well as the jet-assisted takeoff feature during their evaluation period at the Special Air Warfare Center. Flight duration, speed, and performance handling were also scrutinized and evaluated. After four months of evaluations, the first Air Commando Wing, the Air Force was pleased with the prototype. 
and in October of 1963, the U.S. Air Forces contracted on Mark to build 40 B-26Ks for a cost of $13 million, the sum that is equal to $114.4 million today. 27 of these planes would be coming from the davis monthan Air Force Base Storage Facility, and 13 were being transferred from still active units. However, despite their pleasure with the prototype, the Air Force wanted some changes to the design. The production B-26Ks would be different from the prototype in the following ways. The internal wing guns were deleted. The jet-assisted takeoff capability was removed. The cockpit air conditioning was removed. Nose wheel steering was removed. The engine fire extinguishers were removed. The 2,500 horsepower R28103W water-cooled engines were swapped for 2,500 R2853W air-cooled engines. In their final configuration, the B-26K weighed 43,308 pounds maximum gross weight, or 19,700 kilograms. The standard Invader had a maximum gross weight of 35,000 pounds or 15,876 kilograms. The combat range was increased from 700 statute miles or 1,100 kilometers in a standard Invader to 1,480 statute miles or 2,382 kilometers in the K model. The maximum ferry range of a standard model was 3,000 statute miles or 4,800 kilometers and the K model increased that range to 3,740 statute miles, or 6,020 kilometers. The maximum speed was increased from 312 knots, or 359 miles per hour in a standard invader, to 375 knots, or 431 miles per hour in the K model invader. While decreasing the number of 50 caliber machine guns from the Korean War invaders from 16 guns to 8 guns, the plane increased its bomb load from 6,000 pounds to 11,000 pounds. Although the Invader airframe had improved most operational areas when compared to the standard Invader, this new plane would come with some problems, thanks in large part due to some of the changes made to the production model, but we'll dive into that in another video. There's another bit of interesting history that should be discussed here, something that most people are unaware of. I have seen it discussed on several online forums and message boards that there were no glass nose B-26Ks and or that no glass K models went to Vietnam. This is in fact not true. As part of the order, the Air Force included complete kits for 10 planes to be kitted out with RB-26K models. These planes have all the necessary modifications performed in the field in about four hours to convert them from a gun nose flying machine into a glass nose photo machine. In addition to the glass nose, which housed the K38 forward oblique reconnaissance camera, the RB26K version also had a removable bomb bay system of four cameras and flash ejectors. Inside the bomb bay was a KA-56A mirror camera system with an automatic in-flight processing system and three F-492 cameras mounted at different angles. A vertical P-2 camera was also installed on in the tail. The bomb bay doors themselves were swapped out for ones with head camera holes cut in them. At the time of this filming, I have identified seven planes that were kitted out to the recon package, 640, 641, 643, 648, 655, 657, and 664. If you know of any other K models that had glass noses, please let me know. All 10 of the RB-26Ks were either shot down or converted back into the gun nose variants by 1968. That's it for this episode. In the next episode, we'll begin looking at some of the units that flew the B-26K, starting with the first unit, the first Air Commando Wing. If you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing. If you appreciate our work, please continue supporting our efforts by making a small donation at our website, link in the description. Donations like yours help the Foundation purchase archival records, accident reports, and other material that are crucial for our research. Even a small donation helps. Thanks for watching. See you next time.